So we are going to be starting, and we are on this series called as Abide. Last week, Pastor Mary shared an incredible word about what it means on abiding in the divine. And if, if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to it, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and listen to the entire sermon. I believe it is a powerful sermon, and I believe that my life was changed hearing that sermon. I believe your life will be changed too by hearing that sermon. So I encourage you to go and watch that online. But for those of you who don't know, my name is Joshua Samuel. I am an evangelist. I'm called by God. That's right. Um, I'm not big into titles, but there's a time and place where you need to recognize who you are for you to walk out who you are. And so I am an evangelist. I love preaching Jesus to the lost. My wife can attest to that. Um, I preach Jesus wherever I go. And people get to encounter Jesus because of a life laid down to share about him and who he is and the goodness of what he's done. But the sermon for today, I'm excited about this sermon because I, I just can't wait to deliver this word because it's been brewing and brewing and brewing. And it's been, the best part about this, uh, this whole time of preparation is the amount of revelation God has given me about this topic is incredible. But the, the title of today's sermon is, The Source of Our Abiding is the Holy Spirit. I, I get, I get 45 minutes to tell you about the Holy Spirit and what it means to abide with the Holy Spirit. And I'm super excited because the Holy Spirit is the, is a, is a, is the triune God, but He also lives inside you and I. And He is my best friend. He is, he is, I love Him. We talk a lot. We, we talk almost every 30 minutes. I love the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I just, I'm super excited to share the sermon with you. But I want to start with the story. There was once a king and a queen, and they were returning back to the kingdom from a far, far off distance with their newborn baby from that royal hospital. They're returning back, and their chariot runs into this cart, and on the other side, this cart belongs to this humble pauper, and he's, he's coming back with his newborn baby in his cart from the midwife's house. And in that moment, something happens. There's confusion, and the couples exchange their babies. And so this prince, the heir to the throne, goes with the pauper and his wife to be raised up by this pauper and his wife. But then we see, as he grows up, the pauper says, we don't have enough resources, we don't have food, we don't have money, I want you, my son, to go and beg on that street. And so this prince, who doesn't even know he's a prince, he goes to the street right in front of the palace, and he starts to beg for food and for money. And he's begging and begging, and he's, he's telling himself, my life will never amount to anything. My life is, is worthless right now. He looks across the fence, he looks at the palace and he says, if only I was a prince. My friends, little did the prince know who he truly was. Little did the prince know that the very road, the street that he was walking in belonged to him. Little did the prince know that the, the palace that he was looking at was his own inheritance. How true is it? How true this is for many Christians. It is easy to go through life doing the same thing. Never have, they have never taken time to find out who you belong to. You never take time to realize who really your father is. You never really take time to who you are spiritually. You never really take time to understand your spiritual DNA, yet you're, walk, you're working it out in this poverty mentality, even as a Christian. Many believers are unbelievers when it comes to the word of God. My friends, you can be sitting here today in this seat. And you can be a Christian maybe 30 years, 40 years, or you can be a Christian just one year old. Are you living a life of kingship? Are you a living a life of authority and dominion you know the book of revelation talks about what it means for you to walk out this royal identity as a king and priest 
You have a royal identity. We're so, we're so stuck up on us getting free that we forget that we actually are kings. We want us to be free citizens, but we don't, we don't want to be free kings. That's a word for another day, though. That's a word for another day. But the name of the sermon today is, again, the source of abiding is the Holy Spirit. I want us to open our Bible to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, 26. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. This is what the Bible says. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Somebody say the word abide. abide. You do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. Somebody say all. all. And it's true and it's not a lie. And just at his, as it has taught you. You will abide in him. Somebody say abide. abide. I want us all to close our eyes for a minute. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. We're going to pray and ask God to reveal his word today. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Plow the field of my heart. Plant the seed of your word. Deep within me. Let it bring forth the harvest. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. I want to talk to you about what it means to abide, but I also want to talk to you about this word called the anointing. That word, the anointing. The first point that I have for today is the source of the anointing that you have received is the Holy Spirit. Now the Apostle John, when he's writing this book, he's talking to a group of believers. And he's talking to them and he's encouraging them that the anointing that they have received, that the anointing that is given by the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of them, give, brings them to the knowledge of all truth. The anointing teaches you and brings you into all truth. But there's a parallel story in the Old Testament that I want to talk about. It's the story about the first king of Israel, his name is Saul. The, the people of Israel were a nation chosen by God through Abraham as his own people. And they go and they, they travel for a long 40 years in the wilderness and finally they get to the promised land. And once they get to the promised land that God had promised for them, they cry out to God and say, God, we want to be like every other nation. We want a king for ourselves. This broke the heart of God. This broke the heart of God and God was so heartbroken because God was their king. They were not supposed to be like every other nation. And so this broke the heart of God, but God respects free will. And so God said, you know what? He talks to his prophet, the man of God, Samuel, and he says, Samuel, give them a king. And we're going to pick, pick up at this scenario. First Samuel chapter 9, if you can turn your Bibles there. I'm going to start reading from verse 3 and I'm going to... I'm going to dissect this to explain what the anointing is. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, was lost, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shilisha, but they did, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalim and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, and they did not find them. When they had came to the land of Zerv, Saul said to his servants who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys, and becomes worried about us. You see, in this text, there's something interesting happening. So Saul's father, Kish, tells his son Saul, Hey, we've lost our donkeys, I want you to go and get them. So Saul, along with the servants, they decide to go and get them. And they go to different locations, Ephraim, Shalisha, and Benjamite, and all these different locations. But what the Lord taught me was incredible. I love this point so much. As I was studying about this, the Lord began to speak to me, and he said, the donkey represents insignificant things in people's lives. The donkey didn't have a lot of value in and of itself. Maybe it had some materialistic value. 
but it didn't have a value to the overarching theme of what is true meaning of life. It didn't have a value of, of how Saul could find his own identity in it. The donkey represents the insignificant. But we see these four locations. Ephraim, Shalisha, Shalim, and Benjamite. These four locations, when I studied about it, I looked at it, and I'm looking at the map, and it's, you know, Ephraim is on the north, Shalisha is on the west, um, Shalim is in the south, and Benjamin is on the, on the east. And the Lord began to speak to me, and he said, my people are going in circles from north, west, south, and east, looking for insignificant things like a donkey. And many of us can relate to that because before we met the Lord, we were doing the same thing. Before we met the Lord, we were chasing money. We were chasing fame. We were chasing even pleasures of sin. We were chasing after our own pleasures, after lust. We were doing things that we were not proud of. We were, we were lying and cheating and being addicted to pornography and video games and all these things going in circle knowing that today, even though we sin, we have to go back in a circle. And come back again because it wa- we want more. You have enough money, you go back in a circle. And you come back to that same spot where you, even if you get all the money in the world, you still want more. You get the best car, you want a better car. You want the best job, you get a better, you want the best home, you, get a, you want a better home. You're going in circles looking, after, looking for insignificant things. 1 Samuel chapter 9, again verse 6, and he said to them, look, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. My friends, as you are looking for these insignificant things, someone came to you along your path and pointed you towards God and you stopped going in circles and you decided to go after the Lord verse 7 then Saul said to his servant but look if we go what shall we bring the man for the bread in our vessels is all gone and there is no present to bring the man of God what do we have so they're saying hey the servant says we don't have any bread to give this man of God we don't have have any present we don't have any gift It reminds me of some of us before we met the Lord. You know the word bread represents the presence of God. God poured out manna from heaven in the wilderness. For those of you who don't know, the Israelites were in the wilderness 40 years and they didn't have food at the time. God poured out bread from heaven so that they could could eat. The bread also symbolizes something pure and holy because they take the bread, it's called the show bread, it's in the tabernacle in the presence of God in the holy place. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The word bread represents the presence of God. My friends, many of you sitting here and those of you watching, you've said, God, maybe you used to go to church before you got saved. Maybe you used to have the bread. You were going in circles, you knew what the presence of God was like, but then you decided to go to God, and the first thing you realize is, wait a minute, I don't have the presence of God to go back to God. And then it changes your mentality, and now you're thinking, wait, I gotta give a gift, I gotta give a present to God, I gotta do some kind of a bargaining deal with God, so that God could give the answers that I'm looking for. And we come to God with a bargain, saying, God, I... I wish I had something to offer you. Some of, some of the people who are watching online or who, who are sitting here, they're still in this place where you want to come to God, but you're saying, hey, I want to be perfect. I want to be sinless. My friend, let me tell you something. You do not change when you come to God. I mean, you, 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 you do not, you want, you want to be perfect before you come to God. But when you come to God, that's when he perfects you to become into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So, while well, Saul was trying to bargain with God, the, man, the servant is pointing him to God. And he's trying to bargain at this time. But let's see what happens next. Verse 7, Then Saul said to his servant, But look, no, we read that. So then we go to the next part, where we see in verse 8, And the servant answered to Saul and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth a shekel of silver, 
I will give that to the man of God to tell us where we should go or tell us our way. You know, a, qu- a quarter shekel of silver is almost invaluable at that time. In today's day and age, that's pennies. A quarter shekel of silver is very less. It's almost nothing. He said, you know what? I have a quarter shekel of silver. I think we can give that to the man of God. My friend, many of us came to God that way. We said, God, we don't have the presence. We don't have the bread. We don't have any gift to offer you. We, can't, we don't have any gift. But all we have is our worthless self, our sin and our baggage. This is who we are. This is all we got to offer. It's seemingly nothing to you, God. But we come just as we are to you. We come just as we are to you. And so we, we say, God, I am addicted. I am broken. I do have a baggage. But we come to God. So what happens next, I want to paraphrase for the sake of time. So the servant and Saul, they decide to go to Samuel. And as they were climbing the hill, they met a bunch of women who, who they asked, where is this prophet Samuel? And they said, Samuel's in the city, he's going to a high place. Go and meet him before he goes. And then we pick back on verse 14. So they went to the city, and as they were coming into the city, there was Samuel. He was coming towards them on his way to a high place. Now when the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him. Somebody say the word anoint. You shall anoint him commander over my people Israel that he may save my people from the land of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So Saul and his servant, they go and they ask these women and they say, Hey, hurry up, go before he's, he's gone up the hill. So they're walking to Samuel and they find Samuel. But a day before they arrived and met Samuel, God had spoken to Samuel. God spoke to Samuel in his ear and said, Tomorrow you will meet a man. And he is going to be the commander of my people. And he is going to be the king of my people. And I want you to anoint him. I want you to anoint him because I have heard the cry of my people. My friends, when we came to God, when we stepped into God, when we stepped into that church, when we listened to that evangelist, when we listened to the pastor for the first time, after going in circles after circles, we decided to come to God finally. We said, God, we only want answers. We want answers how you can please me. Saul only wanted to know where his donkey was. But God had other plans. But God had a bigger plan. But God had a bigger purpose. Even though Saul came and looked looked to look answers for insignificant things such as a donkey, God was about to anoint him as the king of the people and set the people free. In the same way, my friends, you, when you came and you said, God, take away my baggage, take away my sin. Or God, tell me how to be rich. Then all the problems of the world will go away. And I will be free. Tell me who my right spouse is. If only you can save my children, I'll come to you. And many of us come to a place where we bargain with God, but God has something way, way, way bigger. Way, way, way bigger. The Bible says, before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. Before the foundations of the earth, he chose you to be his people. My friend, if only you can realize that God has a bigger plan for you than you can ever think or imagine. You came to God to say, I want to break free from my addiction. You came to God to heal your broken heart. You came to God to get a big house. You came to God to get a raise. You came to God to get the right spouse. You came to God to get wealthy. But God has a bigger plan for your life. Can I get an amen? God has a bigger plan for your life. This is the definition of the, un- the word anointing because Saul was anointed. My friend, the anointing is the divine empowering through the Holy Spirit. For a task that is greater than yourself to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. The good news is according to 1 John 2.27, our scripture for today, 
You have already received this anointing. And this anointing will lead you into all truth. It already abides in you. Somebody say the word abide. It already abides in you. This is what 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. This is what John 14.16 says. This is Jesus talking. I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide. Somebody say abide. Abide with you forever. In Acts 2.38. But you might be asking, hey, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? Acts 2.38. This is what it says. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The moment, you, the moment you repent, the moment you are following sin and you said, God, I'm done with this, just like Saul. I'm done going in circles. I'm going to turn and I'm going to follow you. And when you repent and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, something supernatural happens. God in his fullness through his Holy Spirit comes to abide in you. Somebody say abide. He already abides in you. You already have the anointing through the Holy Spirit. You are already anointed to do mighty works for God. When you are looking to just be free from your addiction, God is looking at you and telling, Son, I've already set you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He's already set you free. If only you can come out of a place of freedom and walk in your kingship and in the authority, your life will be so much better. In Jesus' mighty name. The point number two for today is this. The abiding anointing that leads you into all truth. It leads you into all truth. In that verse that we read, our core scripture in 1 John 2.27, the latter half of it says, you do not need that anyone teach you. But, that, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all truth. Listen to what John 16 verse 13 says. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. My friend, let me tell you one thing. The Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a he. He is a part of a triune God and he is God himself and he is the God who lives on the inside of you and abides in you. He's not not this genie where you just go to him whenever you need, but he is God in the fullness. This is a mystery. Think about this. God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's all powerful and he lives on the inside of you. And can I go one level deeper? Somebody say deeper. deeper. Are you living like God is living on the inside of you? That's a whole different level. That's a whole different place. But the anointing will lead you into all truth. Let's go back to the story of Saul. 1 Samuel 9 verse 17. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place so you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow, listen to this carefully, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. Verse 20. But as for your donkey that, you were, that was lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom all the desire of Israel, is it not on you? And on your father's house? And Saul answered and said to him, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? So what happens here is, Saul and his servant, finally they meet Samuel. And Samuel, they go to Samuel, this is a funny part. They go to Samuel and be like, Hey, where is the prophet? And Samuel says, I am the prophet. And then, they're like, okay, can you tell us about, they didn't, even, they, didn't even, they didn't even ask, but he says this, this is what he says. He says, go, go before me to the high place, go with me to where I'm supposed to go, and tomorrow I will let you go, tomorrow I'll let you go, but I will tell you the desires of your heart. Wait a minute. Saul's thinking to himself right now, hey, we came for answers about the donkey. 
And right now he's trying to tell me the desires of my heart. Who does he think he is? But watch the next verse. He says, wait a, Samuel says, hey, you've lost your donkeys three days ago. And Saul's like, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> this man must be a prophet. And he said, don't worry, they'll be found. And now he has a different approach. Wait a minute, this guy knows things. And so now he's trying to trust him. And so from that place, he's, he says, okay, I will go. And then he goes on to say, do not be anxious about them. He says, all of, desire, all of the desire of the entire nation is on you. The entire nation wants a king, and you're that man. The, your entire tribes, the, and, and it's talking about you. They're wanting a king. Remember those rumors you heard that we want a king, we want a king? It's talking about you. And Saul's immediately taken back. I came for donkeys and now he's asking me to be a king? Who am I? I'm from the lowest tribe. I'm from the lowest place. Who am I? Isn't it amazing to see once you've received the anointing that the blessing comes along? Like he goes to find out about the donkeys. He doesn't say a word. But immediately Samuel says, don't worry about your donkeys, they'll be found. In the same way, friend, you might be coming to God saying, God, what about my addiction, pornography addiction? What about my addiction to fornication? What about all these things? God's like, wait, 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 don't worry about that. I got that taken care of. You're going to be okay. You're going to be better because I'm going to set you free. And God already gives you it. But he's calling you to some other place. He's saying, hey, take your eyes off this level and look higher because I'm calling you higher. I'm calling you higher. But isn't it so sad that our biggest enemy of our destiny is ourselves? Our biggest enemy of our destiny is ourselves. We are the only ones who disqualify our, our call and our purpose and our destiny. When God says you are a king, you're supposed to live like a king. You're wealthy beyond anything. We still live with a poverty mentality just like that prince. And we need to come to a place where we actually believe in God and stop disqualifying ourselves and say, God, we will step out in truth because we know that you have empowered us. You have called us to be ambassadors to be kings in this kingdom Lord Saul was disqualifying himself we see this also with Moses you know Moses he meets God in this burning bush and God tells him go and talk to the king he says but but I stammer but do you know what Acts I think Acts chapter 7 talks about this it says Moses he was equipped in all kinds of writing and speech. Wait a minute. Moses was equipped in speech and he's telling God he stammers? Was that really true? Because Acts talks about Moses. He was equipped in speech because he was raised by a king. But the funny part about that story is this. At the end, you know Moses did not reach the promised land and do you know why? God told Moses, speak to the rock for the water to come out but Moses was still living in his insecurity that he said God I, I, I don't think I can do it and he struck the rock and immediately said God said Moses you're not going to enter the promised land you're disqualifying yourself and you're not I've given you time I've spoken to you I've established you I've given you strength I've done all these signs and wonders but you are disqualifying yourself in that time And so then the story goes on. And after this, Samuel invites Saul to go up with him to a high place for a meal and sets a meal apart for him, seats him in a place of honor. On the next day, early in the morning, they left and they were walking downhill. And Samuel asks Saul to tell his servants to separate from him because he's going to do something. And after they separate, then Samuel takes the oil and anoints him to be king. My friend, what circles are you in that God is calling you to separate yourself so that he can anoint you into your destiny? 
There was a reason why Samuel said to Saul, get your servants away, I need to talk to you privately. There's a season in a wilderness that Jesus had to go through where he went through the wilderness where he was alone and God had to strengthen him and empower him through his Holy Spirit, talking about abiding in the Holy Spirit. But on the other side of the wilderness, Jesus came out of the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a place where you need to say no to your friends and you need to come to a place where you're like, God, I want to do your will, but I can't be with this friend anymore because they're stunting my growth. I need to separate from them so that I can be anointed by you to be used by you. God will anoint you privately. Listen to me carefully. God will anoint you privately before he ever exalts you publicly. It's a, public, it's a private affair before it gets public. But it is going to be public. Because God wants to use every single one of you in this room. Every single one of you is watching online. God wants to use you in a huge way. He wants to use you to influence your sphere of influence. God has given each one of you a sphere of influence. He wants to use you. It's about time you separate from the people and you come to a place and say, God, I will be used by you. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. 1 Samuel 10, 3 and 4. We go into the next chapter. Then three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. Wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from the hands. Remember I told you what the bread represents? Can somebody answer me? What does the bread represent? The presence of God. When you came to God, just like Samuel, you thought, God, I've lost the presence. I'm coming to you with a quarter shekel of silver. Nothing, it's not significant, but it's me and my worthless sin and my addiction. Here I am, use me, Lord. But God's saying, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to give you back the donkeys that you're looking for, but I'm also going to give you back the bread. I'm going to give you back my presence, and you're going to be empowered to walk in a royal identity through the anointing that abides with in you. After that, Samuel goes on to say that you will meet a company of prophets and the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will prophesy. And so Saul goes and meets a bunch of prophets and the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he begins to prophesy. And the people start to look at him and wonder, hey, isn't this just Saul? But he's prophesying. What just happened to him? Look at what it says in the next verse. So it was, not in the next verse, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9. So it was when he turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. And all those signs that Samuel said, all those signs came to pass that day. Whatever Samuel said, you're going to go and you're going to prophesy this, that, and the other. Everything came to pass. But the important point I want to focus on is he gave him another heart. Wait a minute. When you, when you met Jesus, he, he doesn't just convert your heart. He gives you another heart. Wait a minute. When you were struggling in your sin and addiction and brokenness, you said, God, if only I can change myself. But God says, no, no, no. I'm going to make you new. I'm going to make you a new creation. And you're going to be born again. You're going to be walking in a royal identity. I'm going to give you a new heart. Then Samuel goes and he assembles all the tribes. And he says, behold, there's a king. We're going to anoint this king. And so he assembles all the tribes and, and they start to cast lots to pick out which tribe the king should come first. And it fell on the tribe of Benjamin. And then it fell on Kish. And then Saul was selected. But let's see what happens here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 20. 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had chosen the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, they could not, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, there he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and they brought him from there. And when he stood among them, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. My friend, so 
what happens here is they bring up, Samuel gets all these tribes together. We're going to anoint the king and they cast lots and the tribe of Benjamin, the king's going to be cast lots and it's going to be Matri family. They cast lots and it's, it's going to be Saul, but there's nobody called Saul here. Wait a minute, where is Saul? He was already anointed king. Saul was hiding and then they said, God, where is he? He's not here. And God says, no, 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 he's hiding. My friend, you know that fear makes you see you, fear makes you see yourself smaller than who you are. Small enough for you to hide in, a, in, a, in the equipment, hide in a barrel, while God has already anointed you. God has already equipped you. You have everything you need, but you're still hiding. It's not a coincidence, my friend, to see that Saul was head and shoulders above everyone, but yet at the same time, he was hiding in a small barrel. Fear can reduce your stature, can reduce how, the way you see yourself, and make you hide even in a barrel. That's the power of fear, my friend. Many of you are walking in freedom already, but you're crippled by fear to walk out your God-given destiny. And it's, it's not God who sees you lesser than yourself. It's not the people who see you lesser than, than yourself, but it's you who see yourself lesser than yourself and you're going in hiding. But today I declare the word of the Lord. As a Samuel I say, right now in Jesus mighty name, you will not fear. You will walk in authority. You will walk out your God given destiny. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Hallelujah. Fear has no power on you. You might be saying, I'm anointed but I'm not, I'm, I can't be a pastor. My friend, you've got it all wrong already. You know, the, the job of a pastor, the job of an evangelist is much like the job of a water boy. We are only supposed to get you the water to drink for you to play on the field. You are the ones who are supposed to go out into all the earth and you are the ones who are supposed to make that impact. You are the ones who are supposed to influence the world. This platform is not the goal. Your sphere of influence is the goal. God has already empowered you. God has already anointed you. He already abides in you. What are you going to do with it? I want to share a story about this doctor. His name is Dr. Chansey Crandall. He's one of the leading medical surgeons. And even though he's a doctor, he has his own practice. Every patient that comes to his office, he prays for them, he preaches the gospel to them, and he also, he also operates on them and he treats their physical ailment. The anointing is not meant for the platform. The anointing is meant for you to be the platform. For you to be the platform. There's another story I want to share about this man named David Green. His parents were preachers. His parents, his father was an evangelist. A mighty man of God. So his mom said, okay, I'm going to put you in Bible school. You're going to be equipped to be this man of God. So he went through the grind. He, he went to Bible school and he didn't do good. He went to become a preacher. He didn't do good. It came short. But did you know that he said, you know what? I'm going to quit this even though my mom has this huge burden on me. And I'm going to go and I'm going to start my own business. And he starts his own business. And his business starts to flourish. And today, if you've heard of the name Hobby Lobby, he is the owner of Hobby Lobby. His parents are preachers. He thought he, they thought he was supposed to be a preacher. But no, God had anointed him in the business realm for him to influence that way. And today he makes millions of dollars and gives it to the church to advance the kingdom, to proclaim the kingdom of God. I want to talk to you about my last point, the abiding anointing that uses you to conquer. The abiding anointing that uses you to conquer. My friend, if you've encountered God, I want to prophetically declare to you today that every dream that you think you cannot achieve by yourself, God is breathing fresh wind upon your dream. And He's giving you strength and courage to act in faith and not fear. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 26, this is what it says, And Saul went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, those whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him, and they brought him no presents. 
but he held his peace. My friends, the moment you step out into your destiny and you begin to follow God, God will surround you with men and he will put it in people's heart to come alongside you, to propel you, to accomplish the task that he has for you. He propels you and he, he gives you encouragement. The, the word valiant men means men who do not fear. He knew Saul was a man of fear. So he had to surround Saul with men who were valiant, who did not have the mindset of fear to propel him into his God-given destiny. Who are you? Who do you need in your life who can propel you in your weakness towards your God-given destiny today? But think that the last part of that it says there were some naysayers. My friends, you will face opposition when you chase after a God-given dream. You will face after a, you will face opposition. It might be the close ones near and dear to you. And they'll be like, who is this man? We can't trust him. There are going to be naysayers all the time. But you have to push through because it goes on to say he held his peace. You cannot go to a place where you start looking at the naysayers and talking to them and you lose your peace rather than achieve the God-given dream that God has given you. The story goes on to say, for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap it up with this. There comes this man, his name is Nash. And he's an Ammonite. He comes to this people group called this Jabesh Gilead. And he said, hey, I'm going to conquer you. And so the people say, hey, you can do whatever you want with us. We surrender already without any war. But he said, no, 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 no. I'm going to gouge out your eye and bring reproach on all of Israel. I'm going to gouge out your eye. And so what happens is they said, okay, wait, 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 wait. We're going to ask for help. If nobody helps us, we'll come to you and we'll surrender. You can do whatever you want. And so the, the, the letter was sent from, from Jabesh Gilead to all over Israel. And all the people started to cry. But when the news came to Saul, he looked and he said, Who are these people? Why are they crying? I'm going to do something about it. We see this in 1 Samuel 11 verse 4. It says this, So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in, in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd of the field. And Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul. When he heard the news, his anger was greatly roused. So he took a yoke of oxen, he cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying whatever does not go out with whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle so it shall be done to this oxen and the fear of the Lord fell on all the people and they came out with one consent my friend this part gets amazing you are the answer to the people who are crying around you because God has already anointed you if only you will let the Holy Spirit who abides in you to come upon you and you do not start crying with them but you stand up and raise your hands and says why are you crying and this is what Saul did he took a yoke of the oxen that the yoke of the oxen he cut it into pieces and he said he said this is what will happen to all those who do not come for battle my friend what's interesting is this it's the yoke of the anointing that breaks every bondage and addiction. It's the yoke of the anointing that breaks every yoke and bondage. When you recognize that you're anointed, you understand that you carry a superior identity. You have the power to break bondages in other people's lives. Because there are people crying. This is what it said in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Remember what it said. It said, tomorrow about this time, this is God talking, I will send a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander over my people that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon that cry. My friend, God has anointed you and equipped you for you to go into your sphere of influence and for you to stand up and say, not on my watch. I'm going to fight this fight. I'm going to fight this fight. 
because there are people who are crying in your workspace there are people who are crying in your family before they go to bed nobody sees their cry but they're crying out to God they're saying God if only you were real if only you can help me if only you can save me if only you can set me free my friend God has given you the stewardship as a king to go into your place of influence to go into the dark places and proclaim the word of the Lord and when you proclaim the word of the Lord every yoke is broken there is freedom there is freedom there is freedom the anointing that abides in you is for you to conquer it's for you to conquer you have been anointed to conquer there are people who are waiting for you to step out in brave there are people who are waiting for you to step out in faith are you going to be the one I want us all to stand real quick I want all of us to close our eyes this is a holy moment I don't know about you but I feel the fire of God in this place <laughs> destinies are being formed every dream that has been put on a shelf is coming back to life you are walking in your God-given authority today when you leave those doors something supernatural is gonna break no more fear will keep you in hiding no more addiction will keep you bound I declare to you the word of the Lord be free in the mighty name of Jesus and go and accomplish your task that God has laid out before you today if you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with God maybe you're the one who's going in circles and circles looking for an answer and you don't know what that answer is right now it is your time my friend if that is you and if you're in this room I want you to raise your hand high in the high in the sky if that is you I want you to raise your hand and if you're watching online and you're hearing the sermon saying I've been going in circles I need freedom I want to tell you that there's a new king his name is Jesus Christ there is a new kingdom that is his kingdom that can be only conquered through love we go we do not war against flesh and blood but against every principality power and we do it by the power of love that's our secret weapon love this Valentine's Day I want to tell you that the power that you possess to conquer is love you've already been anointed you are already you have the abiding of the Holy Spirit God on the inside of you so for those of you who raised your hand keep your hands raised I want you to pray this prayer after me say dear Lord Jesus I come as a sinner in need of a savior Jesus I've been going in circles save me now I call on your name now save me Lord wash me clean from all my sin I receive your forgiveness and I, and I choose to walk out the royal identity in Jesus mighty name Amen. I want to pray for the second group of people real quick. If you have dead dreams, I want you to raise your hand all over this place. If you have dead dreams that God has, you've put it on the shelf and you're waiting because you're fearful that you cannot achieve them. I want you to raise your hand. There's an anointing in the atmosphere to break the yoke. So right now, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my dreams back to you. I can only do it with you, God it's bigger than myself I do not choose to put faith in my fear but I choose to put faith in you Lord resurrect my dead dreams you are the God of the resurrection in Jesus mighty name I pray right now yeah give a round of applause